Hello, we are on a chapter covering two topics, science or the scientific method, scientific process, and then systems. There, there are two different topics, but um, both appropriate for environmental science. So let's start with the part on science first. So science is simply the process of uh, producing knowledge. And I write here that it's the notion of cumulative knowledge because findings in science build on other findings. So usually when research is done, sometimes it's novel new research, but often it's um, filling gaps or it's finding, it's, it's building on someone else's research. So, you know, there's this idea of people doing studies, but there's also this idea of the body of literature. So these are the various principles that are involved in it. You know, in empirical, we look at things empirically, meaning that things, you know, we, we collect data from things that are observable, right? So often, um, you know, when you, do a, when you do a study, you're going to try to come up with, with variables that you can measure that you can observe right and then there's this idea of uniform scientists tend to look for patterns in different things so they tend to look for like universals right that doesn't mean that that they always exist but that's kind of one of the goals and parsimony means um like simplicity so when you have two explanations that are equally reasonable the one that is parsimonious or the one that is simpler is the one that is preferable. And then uncertainty, because things don't always stay the same, meaning that, you know, we have an idea about something. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be that. For example, um, you know, we evolutionary biologists built a family based on morphology based on like skeletons you know what things look like so if things looked alike they must have had like similar parents or like a similar ancestor right but when dna came it came became affordable like in the 1990s we that was a, a new technology and that was like new evidence and you know evolutionary biologists realized that things they thought were related were in fact not related just because they both have similar wings doesn't mean that they're uh, they're related to each other, right? And and that also kind of uh, brings us to the next point: proof is elusive. You never know a hundred percent. There's very few things that we absolutely know for sure, right? There there's theories that are strong, but you don't know for sure. And then when we want to um, answer questions, we need testable questions. We, we need something that you could design an experiment around. How are you, if you're gonna say that A leads to B, well, how are we going to measure A and how are we going to measure B? So the sciences, and I put here hard and soft sciences. Um, hard sciences, you know, are, and, and, you know, that's kind of a loose term that, that people use, but hard sciences tend to be things like, you know, biology and chemistry and physics and soft sciences tend to, they, that's what we call things like um, psychology and sociology. They're all sciences. They all use the same format, the same methods. It's just that one tends to rely more on quantitative data meaning like numbers, and one will tend to rely on, on qualitative data. So, you know, things like uh, interviews. And so, but there's a standard format that <clears throat> researchers follow in the sciences, and it's, it's listed here. So, you know, you, you have a question, you, I, you, you, you see something, you see something that is perhaps um, correlated or, or linked to each other, and you come up with a hypothesis. That's just simply an educated guess. I think that A leads to B, right? You notice something, then you come up with a hypothesis, and then we design a test and collect some data, 
And then once you get that data, you have to interpret what does that mean? You know, was your hypothesis correct? Was your hypothesis incorrect? And then we send that out for peer review. So usually kind of a standard thing you do is you send it into a journal, your, your research, and that journal is gonna send that research out to three experts, to three people that do things similar to what your study was on, right? And so that's kind of the first check. You don't just make statements. We need to, to we need some kind of reliability, right? So other people are going to look at it. They're gonna check it over. Does that seem plausible? Do the research methods seem plausible? And if so, then you publish your findings, right? And that goes into the wider body of literature. Studies should be reproducible, you should be able to replicate them. That's the other check. So the first check is that you have three experts look at your research before you publish it, peer review. The second one is that in your study, you've mentioned all the materials that you used in your methods, the way you did it so that someone else can copy your study exactly. So if you're telling, you know, if, if, if your research is true, then you should be able to reproduce those results as well. And that just makes your findings stronger when someone else reproduces it, right? But if, if, if somehow there was like, you know, you had your own bias in doing the research and it wasn't done well, when someone else does it again, they're going to get different uh, results. So that's why the idea that it should be um, easy for someone to replicate, that's a very important idea. So we have different kinds of, these are two different ways of approaching research, two different types of reasoning. And, you know, all these things that I'm going to be talking about for the next 10 slides or so are um, ideas that fit in a lot of classes. Like if you're going to take psychology or sociology or biology, these ideas are going to be discussed, right? These are kind of universal ideas for research. So we have deductive and inductive reasoning. And you might have heard of this already, right? Deductive reasoning, you're inferring specific ideas from general things that we know. This is a little harder to do because the general things that we know, that you, you know, you should really know that that's true, that that really happens. Then you can make inferences from that general idea, right? So we know that the sun, I'm just using that as an example. We know that the sun sets every day. So therefore I can make the, a reasonable assumption that the sun's going to set tomorrow because it's just that's kind of a you know it's like a law you know i know if i pick up um my keys and i let them go out of my hand they're going to fall to the ground right because there's a law of gravity that's a that's a general thing that we know and based on that i'm going to assume that if i open my hand up the keys are going to fall down and not in fact go up right but what's more common is inductive reasoning. That's coming up with a general from a specific. So you're going from, from specific to general. It's kind of moving in the other direction. And so I use the example, you know, it gets hotter when the sun rises every day. So the sun itself must be hot. Well, how do you know? You know, did you touch the sun? Did you go out there? You don't, I mean, yeah, I mean, people, you know, you, you, you look up there and it's bright and astronomers have told you things about the sun, right? But you didn't actually, no one's actually touched it, right? So that's, that's kind of an, a stretch, you know, but that's inductive reasoning. So, um, you know, that's kind of going at it the other way. So we have what we call the scientific method and there's different... There's different variations on it, but it essentially involves these steps. We kind of already went over this. You see something, you make, it starts with an observation, right? So the scientific method always starts with a hype, an observation. Then you come up with a hypothesis. And I had to put here educated guess, because that's what it is. You're making an assumption about what is going, you know, what is going on here. I notice that when I do A, B happens. You make that's your observation, right? So you make it a hypothesis. 
A is if A, then B. Then, okay, how are we going to test that? I need to design an experiment, and I need to somehow test that A equals B. I'm going to collect my data, and then I'm going to interpret the data, and either I accept the hypothesis or I reject the hypothesis. We usually start off with what we call the null hypothesis, so we're actually rejecting our hypothesis. And that sounds kind of um, backwards, but... Um, it's easier to reject a hypothesis than accept it because to accept a hypothesis means that you have looked at every conceivable possibility. And your book talks about, you know, you see 100, I forgot what kind of bird it was, right? You see 100 swans and they're all white, right? So in order to come up with a hypothesis that all swans are, are white, you have to look at every swan on the planet. And that's going to, I mean, how difficult is that, right? But all you have to do is find a swan that is not white and you reject the hypothesis. Right? So it's easier to find one exception than it is to go search out every living bird to see that they're all one color. So a hypothesis is an educated guess. That's kind of our first stage. You know, that is when you're saying, I think that this leads to this. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have laws, right? And so I'm using here the law of gravity. There's very few laws. Laws are like, we can definitely say that that's true, right? I've never dropped an object and it actually floated up. It always hits the ground right the law of gravity has not been disproven between things that are laws and hypotheses we have theories theories can can be more like a hypothesis right i have a hypothesis i did one study turns out my hypothesis was right but that's just one study maybe i did my study wrong maybe i have biases uh maybe that's you know what 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 applies where I live doesn't apply to some other place, right? So you don't believe a theory right off the bat. However, when other people start doing the same research and adding, they start strengthening that theory and it starts to become stronger and stronger and stronger. It's still 100% guaranteed, right? So theories, so if, if you know, if, if, if hypothesis and laws are like black and white, the theories are grays and there's all different areas of grays. So, you know, it, it, it all depends. But the more that it's tested and the more it holds true, the stronger that theory is. But we typically don't say that something happens 100% of the time. You know, we usually say, well, we're confident that it's going to be between like so and so and so. So think about like elections, right? They never say, oh, we're 100% sure that, you know, or, or, or we're certain that like uh, this candidate has got 56% of the vote. They always give a margin of error, right? So they say within this range, right? It's never 100%, right? And there's usually... So there's usually a confidence interval and there's usually like a probability. What's the probability that, that I'm wrong, that all the things that I, you know, all the people that I talk to just by chance, they happen to all say the same thing, right? So usually you say something like 95 is a typical number. I'm 95% sure, right? But there is a 5% chance that my findings happen just by chance and i'm using an example here about flipping a coin right if you flip a coin once what's your chance you know it's very likely that you're going to get heads right it's 50 percent chance if you flip it twice is it unheard of that you're going to hit heads twice no that's reasonable three times that's that happens right five times yeah that's unlikely but it can happen right so the more you flip that coin Okay, what if I flip it a thousand times? Okay, well, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna hit heads every time, right? 
So, um, so you you give like a, a probability. You, you we never say a hundred percent. You might say even it's very common to say ninety nine percent, right? It but it depends. You know, a larger sample's better. If 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 I'm doing a poll for a, like a presidential poll, well, what's a good sample size? Well, a good sample size is like. 100 million people, 150 million people. Well, that's ridiculous, right? You can't do that. You can do 5,000, right? So, but if I'm gonna do 5,000 people, that's a smaller sample size. So I'm not gonna be able to be as confident. If I did 150 million people, yeah, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you 99.5%. I'm 99.5% sure that like it's this number, right? If I pull 5,000 people, well, I'm not, my confidence is going to go down. I'm not going to give you 99.5%, right? I'm going to bring it down to like 90% or 95%, right? So, um, and, but because there's other things that circumstances also influence this, right? You can randomly, and this happened in the 2016 election, you can randomly sample people, but circumstances also affect it. Some people that voted for Trump didn't want to say, I'm going to vote for Trump. Right. So that was a circumstance that threw off the whole thing, that threw off the probability. That's why the pollsters were, they had it wrong. They didn't, they didn't account for circumstances, right? When you go out, there's a certain chance you're going to get COVID. They've got it worked out. They've got the probability. But what if you're someone that stays away from other people and you're, wearing five masks and washing your hands and you know you're that's a circumstance that's going to change probability people that do research they have biases and there's lots of biases within us so i'm only mentioning some of the things you can do to reduce bias you collect a large sample we've been i've been talking about that the larger the sample the more accurate it is but it also needs to be random. So the population that you want to infer about, you that that sample needs to be representative, right? So if I'm going to say something about a certain forest, my sample needs to come from, you know, those type of of trees. I can't look at oak trees and pine trees and then make a conclusion about a pine forest, right? But that's not my sample. So. They need to be as random as possible and as representative as possible. So natural experiments tend to be a little bit more accurate because you're looking at things that have already happened. Well, I want to see change in temperature over the last hundred years. Well, we have records for that, right? That happened. So that's more accurate than manipulative experiments. You know, uh, in, in manipulative experience, experiments, we're taking usually like a group. You have like two different groups and you're manipulating variables and you're seeing how that changes. So you're seeing how A changes B. So usually when you do that type, a manipulative, manipulative, wow, I'm going to say it. I have to read it. Manipulative manipulative experiment you have a treatment group and an experiment group so i'm using the example here and and you know this applies to all fields right i might not be doing it in environmental science but you know it, it applies to all fields so you have a treatment group and, ex, and a control group and to kind of make it easy i thought of like a, a weight loss drug right and so you have this pill that causes weight loss. Well, I have to design an experiment to see if it'll work. Well, just off the top of my head, I'm gonna take a group of people and I'm gonna divide them in half and I'm gonna give half the pill, the actual weight loss pill, that's gonna be my experiment group. The other half, I'm not gonna give the weight loss pill to, that's the control group. But you gotta give them something, right? Because they have biases too. Imagine if you're like in a corona vaccine trial and you don't get a shot. Well, you know you didn't get the you didn't get the vaccine, right? Because they didn't they didn't give you anything. You already know it. Right? That's going to influence your behavior. Right. So the ones that 
you know, everyone enrolled in those studies got a shot. Half of them got the virus, the coronavirus, like the actual vaccine, but half of them got like saline solution or something. They didn't get the actual vaccine. You got to get that's a placebo. They gave them a placebo because you don't want anyone to act different. You want to make sure that what you're measuring is the actual vaccine, or in this case, the um, the pill. Right now that I'm thinking of it, the vaccine might have been a better analogy. But you know, you're you're controlling. You you want to test the effectiveness of the pill. So you want everything else to be the same. So if you give one side a pill, you have to give the other side a pill. And then, you know, let's say you weigh them at the beginning and they weigh them every month for like a year and see how the weight changes, right? And so you would get like an average, like a mean, you get like a mean of their weight change and then compare the two groups. Is it a big difference? You know, is the difference between the two groups 30 pounds? Well, that's, that sounds pretty significant, right? The group that got the pill lost 30 pounds in a year. What if it was just one pound, half a pound, All right? That happens. Well, that's not really, yeah, there's a difference between the two groups, but that's not really a significant difference, right? So in this example, there are two variables here, right? So, um, the hypothesis is the weight loss, the pill, the pill will cause weight loss. So you've got two things, one pill, the other one, weight loss. All right, so there's the verb, and so you just go on both sides. One of these is dependent, one of these is independent. So you just ask yourself, which one's doing the depending? Does weight loss depend on the pill, or does the pill depend on weight loss? The pill doesn't depend on weight loss. The pill's the pill. Whether you lose weight or whether you don't lose weight, that pill is just a pill. So the weight loss depends on the pill. So that's the weight loss is the, the dependent variable. Therefore, the independent variable is the other one, the pill. Same thing, sun makes plants grow. Sunlight makes plants grow. Do, does sunlight depend on plants or do plants depend on sunlight? The plants are doing the depending. Therefore, the other one's the independent. And that's usually the one that you manipulate. So if you want to test, does the pill work? You're manipulating the pill. Some group is, you know, some people are getting the pill. Some people are getting the placebo. So <clears throat> um, that's kind of what we were getting at, right? And that was a full, that was a blind study, the example I was giving you, because the subjects don't know. Are they getting the real thing or are they getting the placebo? That's blind. But really, we typically do double blind studies. That's really the standard, right? So if I were to go back to this study, I would divide the group in half. 50 are going to get the, the weight loss drug and 50 are going to get a placebo. I'm going to bring someone else in to hand them out. And so I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know who got the real thing and I don't know who didn't. And neither do the subjects. And then I keep taking their weight, right? So that way I'm not gonna mess with the weight, you know, cause researchers are, are human, right? They might round up, you know, or they might say, oh, you left your shoes on, take off your shoes or something, you know, to try to get the numbers that you want, right? So if I don't know, I'm just going to take the weight and I'm not going to cheat it. I'm not going to play around with it because I don't know who got the real thing and who didn't. Then at the end of the study, I'll call up that person. Okay. Tell me who got it and who did not Right. And then, then I can look that's, that's double blind. The researcher doesn't know and neither do the subjects. So this is the last thing to talk about with, um, with with uh, scientific research, right? Um, it's not people don't always agree when when you say that that when you do a study and you make like a a new you know you find a new a, a new you make a new finding right that's one study 
when you only come out with just one study, some people are going to disagree. Some people are going to agree. So there's some argument about it, right? Other people are going to copy your study and they come up with the same results. Eventually, if your results are, are solid, more and more scientists are going to start agreeing with you. So it's really a body of research. There's, you take a lot of research and then, you know, that shows that something is going on. There's a lot of uh, debate right now about um, global warming, right? Some, there are some scientists that say, look, it's probably not because of us. This is just like a, you know, ebb and flow of, of history. You know, we've had ice ages and, and, you know, we've gone the other direction. And then there's some scientists, the majority of scientists that say, yeah, this is something, you know, we've done research on it and we think that there's something significant about what's going on right now. And this might be us, right? So when you look at the body of research, I'm not going to take one person study saying that, oh, humans are causing global warming, right? That's one study. So you're going to look at, every, you know, everybody, what they're doing, and then you look at, well, what's, you know, what's the consensus? What do most people agree on, like independently? What do they, what do they come up with? What do they agree on? Well, they agree that, that, you know, there probably is a lot of evidence for global warming. And they wouldn't say, even they would tell you themselves, we're not guaranteeing it. We just think that there's very strong evidence to suggest that, that global warming is a fact, like it, it is a thing. Right. So not everyone concurs on, on any subject. There's always detractors. Right. But you, you want to look at the, you want to look at the, the whole thing. The example I was giving you of like DNA, like once we started using DNA, like, a, like really it took off in the nineties, right? That would be a paradigm shift, right? So that's, that was a revolution in science. We can now use DNA to sequence genes. And that tells us a lot of things that we didn't know before. Same thing with other inventions like the microscope or the electron microscope, right? That was a new technology and it shifted the way that people thought. Um, I'm using evolution, right? Because when evolution started to gain traction, it changed the way people thought about, about the environment, right? People thought that uh, a lot of the features of our environment were because um, the whole earth flooded. And, and some people still make that argument. And I'm not saying like something's wrong or right. I'm just saying that, you know, when... When those, when the, when the theory of evolution, and it wasn't just that theory, but when that came out and, and people started moving in that direction, that was like a paradigm shift. They started looking at, at everything around biology and ecology differently. So that is like an introduction to research. Let's talk about systems here. And that's, this is kind of sh changing gears, but so we look at systems a lot in environmental science. And so think of it like the body. If I want to study the body, that's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff to study, right? It's a lot easier if we break it down. And if you, you know, those of you that might have taken anatomy and physiology, it's all broken down into systems. Take the integumentary system and, and then you go to muscular and skeletal, right? Because it's easier to study things when you break it into more manageable parts and we don't get overwhelmed we do that with the environment as well so a system is a network of inter now i'm seeing i put independent here interdependent components and processes right so these materials this energy flows from one part to another part so we break it down the earth itself is just too overwhelming to study so we can break it down we'll study um climate or we'll study nutrient recycling you know we study ecosystems so it, that by breaking it down it helps us it just it helps us understand it systems can often be described by their characteristics so we have open systems and closed systems usually what we're going to talk about will be an open system 
right? Closed systems, the only example I could really think of is the, the earth, like the whole earth, meaning that, you know, nothing really comes in. I mean, you could say that sunlight comes in, but nothing else really comes in and nothing leaves, right? So if you take the whole earth, something like heat is on a planet. It might leave things and go to something else, but things like energy stay within the planet. Right, an open system is, that's what we talk about more often. Things are coming in, out, right? So systems tend to interact with other systems. You know, a, a, a rainforest will interact with whatever climate would be like close to it, right? And sometimes they change. So um, again, here's this word throughput. And that describes energy flowing in and out. And in the last chapter, we talked about, you know, like a, like a household, right? You have, uh, as you have more money, you have more materials coming into your house. You're buying more groceries. You're buying more whatever stuff you buy, right? And that comes into your house, but you're also throwing stuff out, right? So the more stuff that you buy, the more stuff you also throw out, right? That was an example of a household, right? But you could use that analogy on something like a, a rainforest or some kind of ecosystem, right? You have energy coming in and you have things going out as well. And so when we talk about these systems, we're going to talk about negative feedback a lot. Uh, but first, let's explore an example of positive feedback. And you will not see this a lot, positive feedback. But here's an example, right? The leaves grow. They, they trap more sunlight and that allows the plant to grow more and then that's going to in turn make more leaves to make the plant grow faster right so it's feeding on each other but negative feedback is more typical that negative feedback is going to is how we keep homeostasis so that's like the balance right and so i'm giving an example here of something we actually call density dependency so i'm saying there's like too many coyotes and the coyotes eat rabbits, right? Because there's so many coyotes, they're eating up all the rabbits, and now there's not enough rabbits, hardly any, right? So now all the coyotes are competing for a very few number of rabbits. And so they start dying off because there's not enough food. Because they die off, what happens to the rabbits? Well, now they don't have that predator. So they their populations start going up. But because their populations start going up, now the coyotes have more food, right? So you see, it's like, that's an example of negative feedback. It's keeping, it's suppressing change. It's striking this balance. You can't have too many coyotes. You can't have too many rabbits. I don't know why it was coyotes and rabbits. Could have been like wolves and deer or something. I don't know. Just, that was like the example, right? So they're keeping this balance, this equilibrium. Our body works at the, uh, the same way, right? Think about like your blood sugar. You have insulin lowers blood sugar, but you also have glucagon that raises blood sugar, right? So the body works in a similar way. Keep the, keeping this homeostasis. You want to keep things at this, um, like at an equilibrium, at a, at a constant level. There are exceptions to this, of course, right? Some things can make permanent changes. We have, you know, um, desertification. Um, uh, wetland, uh, wetlands are disappearing. Um, we're losing rainforest. There's permanent changes that do happen, and we call these disturbances, right? And some of them are man-made. Some of them are, are natural, right? A drought or a fire. This example, where grassland turns into a desert, that's a that's a whole ecological change, right? And that happens. That that happens. If you look at places like in the Middle East, North Africa. They were once, um, you know, they're once a lot greener, All right? So there are changes, but in general, in general, systems tend to be resilient, meaning that you might have a fire or a drought, but in the long term, they will eventually go back to what they were. So that is uh, chapter two, and I'm going to stop there.